Okay, so this is the fourth recording for the urinary system. Uh, and we're going to talk about regulation of urine concentration and volume. So 85% of water reabsorption is obligatory, leaving behind 15% of water that can be adjusted according to the body's needs. Obligatory means it has to be reabsorbed back in. This facultative water reabsorption of the remaining 15% determines the final urine concentration and the volume. Now osmolarity of filtrate changes throughout the different regions of the nephron until the urine is actually formed. New filtrate entering the renal tubule has the same osmolarity as blood, which is about 300 milliosmoles. The thin descending limb of the nephron loop, which is permeable to water, but not solids, the filtrate becomes more concentrated, reaching about 900 milliosmoles at the bottom of the loop as water diffuses back into the interstitial fluid. With the thick ascending limb, sodium and other ions are pumped out of the filtrate back into the interstitial fluid. Water movement is restricted where it stays in the filtrate, reducing the osmolarity and that reaches about 100 milliosmoles by the time the filtrate reaches its early distal tube. Within the late distal tubule and the collecting ducts, facultative water reabsorption begins. This changes the osmolarity of the filtrate depending on the needs of the body. If less water is reabsorbed as filtrate passes through the late distal tube and into the collecting duct, the filtrate concentration will remain low, less than 300 milliosmoles, resulting in elimination of dilute urine. However, if more water is reabsorbed as the filtrate passes through the late distal tube and the collecting duct, the filtrate concentration remains high, greater than 300 milliosmoles, and this results in the elimination of more concentrated urine. So the kidneys will produce dilute urine when solute concentrations of extracellular fluid is too low in other words, contains too much water. Facultative water reabsorption is turned off as ADH hormone release is suppressed, rendering the late distal tubule and the collecting ducts impermeable to water, meaning that that water will be removed from the body. The osmolarity of the filtrate may fall as low as 50 milliosmoles, as the kidneys are used to eliminating excess extracellular fluid water. Uh, and here you can see um, what you end up having is um, the production of dilute urine. As you move through here, okay, in the absence of ADH, solids are reabsorbed while water remains in the filtrate. And as the solids are leaving, the concentration is decreasing. Kidneys effectively conserve water by producing very concentrated urine reaching as high as 1,200 milliosmoles. And this can occur by two mechanisms. One, the release of ADH turns on facultative water reabsorption. The recall of that water reabsorption happens only by osmosis. Osmosis, if you remember, is the passive process in which will only occur if a concentration gradient is, is present. We have what's referred to as a countercurrent mechanism. This creates and maintains medullary osmotic gradients by exchanging materials in opposite directions between the filtrate and the interstitial fluids. And this involves three factors. The countercurrent multiplier system, which is in the nephron loops of the juxtamedullary nephrons. Remember the juxtamedullary nephrons are the ones that are responsible if you're dehydrated and you're forming concentrated urine. The recycling of urea in the medullary and collecting ducts, and then the countercurrent exchanger in the vesorecta, which is the capillaries of the juxtamedullary nephrons. The countercurrent multiplier proceeds in the following steps. Sodium chloride is actively transported from the thick ascending limb filtrate into the interstitial fluid, raising sodium chloride concentrations outside the nephron. Sodium chloride in the interstitial fluid pulls water out of the filtrate in, thin, in the thin descending limb by osmosis. As sodium chloride continues to be removed from the filtrate, water continues to follow 
making filtrate more concentrated. High sodium chloride concentration in the filtrate allows for continued sodium chloride reabsorption into the interstitial fluid. And you can see the countercurrent mechanism formation of concentrated urine uh, in this example here with these four steps. So the permeability of the medullary collecting system to urea is another important factor in the establishment of the medullary osmotic gradients. As water is reabsorbed from filtrate, urea becomes more concentrated in remaining fluid. In the medullary collecting ducts and papillary ducts, urea follows concentration gradient and passively diffuses out of the filtrate and into the interstitial fluid, further concentrates the medullary interstitial fluid. The permeability of the medullary collecting system to urea, uh, where some urea enters a thin descending limb, so continuously recycles. Note that urea diffusing out of the collecting duct constitutes only a small amount of total urea. Much of the urea actually remains in the filtrate and will actually be removed by urine. So the medullary osmotic gradient is maintained by the vasa recta, vessels surrounding the ducts of medullary loops, acting as a countercurrent exchanger. Like the vasa recta descends into the med medulla in turn and then ascends towards the cortex. The arrangement of the countercurrent flow, blood flowing in opposite direction from the filtrate, enables them to exchange substances. Blood in the descending limb gains sodium chloride and loses water. Blood in the ascending limb loses sodium chloride and gains water. The countercurrent exchanger, uh, by the time the base of recta exits the renal medulla, blood has approximately the same concentration it had upon entering the renal medulla. Return of blood to its initial osmolarity is critical. However, the vas erected to deliver oxygen nutrients to the cells of the medulla without depleting medullary osmotic gradients is necessary for water reabsorption and the production of concentrated urine. Okay. Uh, and here you can see when we look at these juxtamedullary nephron, uh, essentially how you're forming that uh, concentrated urine and where the solids are sort of uh, moving back and forth there between the interstitial fluid and the filtrate. The countercurrent mechanism produces concentrated urine in the following steps. When ADH is present, concentrated medullary interstitial fluid creates a gradient for water reabsorption from the filtrate in the medullary collecting duct. Deeper in the medulla, interstitial fluid is more concentrated, so water reabsorption continues from the medullary collecting duct. Concentrated urine is produced when most water of the filtrate is removed. So if you look here in the deep medulla, you can see how the solids are heavily concentrated in that interstitial fluid, which is gonna draw out more of that water. So when the filtrate enters into the cortical collecting duct, in the renal medulla, there is no osmotic gradient between the filtrate and the interstitial fluid. So no water is actually reabsorbed. In the presence of ADH, now remember this has to be under the presence of hormone, the concentrated medullary interstitial fluid creates a gradient for water reabsorption from the filtrate in the medullary collecting duct. Deeper in the medulla, interstitial fluid is more concentrated. So water reabsorption continues from the medullary collecting duct. Okay. And here you can see uh, sort of putting all those aspects together there. All right. Uh, so this is taking the big picture of renal physiology, what's happening, okay, uh, what's moving where, all right, and this also takes into account, you know, the formation of the concentrated here with the ducts of medullary nephron. Okay, so urine and renal clearance. What is urine? 
urine normally contains water, sodium, potassium, chloride, hydrogen ions, and phosphates, as well as sulfates, metabolic waste, such as urea, creatinine, ammonia, and uric acid. Remember, the urea just cycles back and forth so that you are excreting most of the urea from the body. Small amounts of bicarbonate, calcium, and magnesium may also be present. The urinalysis is used to analyze urine composition as a diagnostic tool for detecting disease. You can look at urine color, uh, which is formed by a yellow pigment, a urochrome, by the breakdown product of hemoglobin. The darker urine is more concentrated, has less water. Lighter urine has less concentrated, has more water. Despite color, urine should always be translucent. Light is able to pass through. Cloudy urine would be a sign that you have some type of UTI uh, as um, that you can actually see the microbial growth, uh, or that there is actually too much protein that's present. Freshly voided urine should have a mild odor. Strong odor may be caused by diseases, infections, or by ingesting certain foods. Normal pH is that urine is slightly acidic. It ranges from four and a half to eight. And the specific gravity compares the amount of solids in solution to that of deionized water. Urine contains solids if specific gravity is greater than one. Normal range is anywhere from 1.001, which is very dilute, to 1.035, which is very concentrated. A lot of the diagnostic tests will also look at renal clearance. This is the measurement of rate at which the kidneys remove substances from the blood. This can be used to estimate glomerular filtration rate, both measured in millimeters of plasma per minute, for substances to provide accurate measure of renal clearance in GFR, the substance should be completely filtered and neither reabsorbed nor secreted. Creatinine is a waste product that is used to estimate renal clearance. Blood levels of creatinine are elevated when the kidneys are impaired. Clearance of creatinine is therefore decreased. Not totally accurate, um, as 5 to 50% in urine arrive via secretion, not filtration. More accurate assessment of GFR can be obtained by using inulin, a complex carbohydrate found in plants such as garlic and artichokes. Neither secreted nor absorbed, it must be injected. Um, some diseases, uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, this is characterized by excess ADH secretion. There can be multiple causes, including ADH secreting tumors. Certain lung tumors are especially prone to this. Uh, results in excess fluid retention, leading to decreased plasma osmolarity and increased urine osmolarity. So how do we transport, store, and eliminate our urine? The urinary tract consists of two ureters, a urinary bladder, and a urethra. The adult urethra is 25 to 30 centimeters long with a diameter that's about three to four nanometers and begins at the level of the second lumbar vertebrae, travels behind the peritoneum and empties into the bladder. The walls are composed of three layers. An adventitia, which is the most superficial layer is made of fibrous connective tissue that supports the urine. A muscularis layer, which is a middle layer, this is made up of smooth muscle cells that contract rhythmically in a peristaltic motion to propel urine towards the urinary bladder. And a mucosal layer, this is the deepest layer, this is the mucous membrane composed of transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelium allows for the contraction um, and expanding of the actual uh, vessel. The bladder, uh, this is a hollow, distensible um, organ on the pelvic cavity floor. It's held in place by the parietal peritoneum. It collapses when it's empty and becomes pear-shaped when it's full, holding 7 to 800 milliliters of urine in males and slightly less in females. 
the trigon, which is a triangular region on the bladder floor, is the openings of the two ureters are at each of the posterior corner. The bladder will have three primary layers. Uh, the adventitia, this is the most superficial layer. It's made of aerial or connective tissue. The detrusor layer, this is the middle layer. Um, the fibers run in different directions to squeeze the bladder, circular band, uh, which will form the internal urethral sphincter, is at the opening of the urethra, and the mucosa is the innermost layer made up of transitional epithelium and underlying basement membrane to protect the bladder from urine. And here we can see our two ureters, uh, and then the bladder right here, and this would be the urethra. Uh, interstitial cystitis, this is caused by inadequate mucus production by the mucosa of the bladder. This allows acid and other toxins in the urine to damage the underlying mucosa and other tissues. It's characterized by frequent urination and pelvic pain. Underlying causes unknown, responds poorly to treatment, and can actually lead to bladder scarring and contraction over a long period of time. The urethra, this is the last segment of the urinary tract. It drains the urine from the urinary bladder to the outside of the body. The walls are similar to the ureters with following exceptions. Opening in the urinary bladder is surrounded by the internal urethral sphincter. Uh, only opens when urine is passing through. The second external urethral sphincter is formed by the levator anti muscle, which is skeletal muscle. This is when you have voluntary control over for urination. Now, both the male and female urethra will differ structurally and functionally. In females, it's about four centimeters in length. It opens at the external urethral orifice between the vaginal tract and the clitoris, and it serves primarily as an exit for urine. In the male, it's about 20 centimeters in length, and it consists of three regions. The prosthetic urethra, which is as the urethra exits the urinary bladder and passes through the prostate gland, the membranous urethra, this is the shortest segment, and passes through the levator ani muscle. And then the spongy urethra, this is the longest segment, passes through the corpus spongiosum of the penis to exit the body at the external urethral orifice. Micturition, uh, this is the process of urination. We're avoiding. This is the discharge of urine from the urinary bladder to the outside of the body. The micturition reflex, this is a reflex arc mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system when urine fills the bladder and stretches the walls. The stretch receptor sends signals to the sacral region of the spinal cord via sensory afferent fibers. Parasympathetic efferent fibers will then stimulate the detrusor muscle to contract and the internal urethral sphincter to relax. This allows for urination. The nutrition center is located in the palms. Given time and training makes nutrition a voluntary process. Okay. So as urine fills in, this puts stretch on the bladder. This, that stretch hits the walls, which get picked up by receptors, parasympathetic fibers. You get the reflect arc, then you come down and you relax the muscles and you urinate. So the overall big picture of urine uh, can be summarized here on this slide, where we have the structure of the kidney, the actual nephron function here, formation and excretion of urine.